Good evening, and welcome to the third biannual University of Baltimore Storytelling Show. This was the year we were gonna be back in the Wright Theater after getting stuck in the Business Center Auditorium in 2018. You should have seen the hissy fit I threw about that Business Center Auditorium. If only I knew what was ahead, performing the show on something called Zoom during a global quarantine. Since our university went online in March, our storytelling class has continued to meet each week to share stories of our past and present. As storytellers have for centuries, we speak these stories live in the moment rather than memorize a script or read from a written essay. And that oral tradition lives on tonight as each of my 17 students shares their favorite story from the semester. Every time I've taught this class, I've been so moved by the way students open up to each other as people and come together as a troupe of performers. This year, it took a special effort to make that happen. I wanna thank all of the students and also Baltimore storyteller, Van Michael Milhouse, Alex Hewitt of Mortified, and my colleague, Stephen Leva, each of whom inspired us on our journey. If you look in the chat, you'll see tonight's program. Some of the students will be performing live, others have pre-recorded their stories. Choose speaker view if you haven't already and mute your mic. Please do add comments and compliments for the storytellers during the event in the chat window. We'll take a five minute intermission between acts. Thank you so much for being part of this unusual and special event, which really seems like the perfect way to celebrate my 62nd birthday. Feel free to join me in a drink. I wish I could share the pizza I got from Pauly G's. Now sit back, relax, and let us tell you some stories. Our first storyteller is Matt Harris with Driving Blind. It was 1977 and just like most American teenagers, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license and buy a car. But even while I prepared for these goals, I wondered if I would ever be able to drive because my eyesight had been deteriorating over the past several years. For instance, not only was I bumping into things more frequently because of tunnel vision, I could no longer see a baseball when it was hit from a bat. Beyond that, night blindness hindered my movement at nighttime, and in the day, my eyes were experiencing extreme sensitivity to sunlight. But despite these symptoms, doctors still couldn't find anything wrong with my eyes and told me I had 20-20 vision, which only further confused the matter. But because I did have 20-20 vision, didn't look visually impaired, memorize my environments whenever possible, and scan my surroundings by moving my head and my eyes from side to side and up and down, I was able to keep my vision problem mostly to myself. I chose to conceal it because no medical documentation existed to explain it. And being the adventuresome teenager that I was, I still went ahead and prepared for my driver's license and bought a car. Even though privately, I believe the MVA would never give me a driver's license. So when I was about five minutes into my first driving test, the driving instructor said, pull it over and put it in park. Why, what did I do, I asked. Didn't you see the stoplight back there, son? I felt like saying, well, if I would have seen the stoplight, don't you think I would have stopped? But I didn't. Instead, I came back a few weeks later and tried again. I stopped at the stoplight that time. Then after breezing through the parallel parking portion of the test, I backed into a wall and heard those dreaded words from the driving instructor again. Put it in park, son. I didn't have to ask him what happened that time. I felt the impact. But after that test, I took a stroll around the perimeter of the course and committed it to memory. So a few weeks later, when I came back from my third try, I negotiated that course like Mario Andretti and walked away with my driver's license. And surprisingly, without any restrictions whatsoever, for my eyesight. So I figured, well, if the MVA couldn't find anything wrong with my eyes, they must be okay, right? I paid $250 for my first car. 
1966 Ford Fairlane that I nicknamed Frida. Fairlane Frida was a rust bucket with heart palpitations in her cylinders and a faulty digestive system as evidence from the foul fumes she often emitted through her exhaust pipe. But poor Frida didn't last very long because I wrapped her around an oak tree. Fortunately, no one was injured. I paid $300 for my second car, another 1966 Ford Fairlane that I nicknamed Franny. Now, Fairlane Franny was an upgrade from Frida. She had eight cylinders instead of six, air shocks and baby moon hubcaps. But Franny didn't last very long either because one day I pulled out in front of a car that slammed into her passenger side door. Fortunately, no one was injured in that accident either. But Franny was a wreck after that. My, I paid $600 for my third car, a 1968 Mustang. I loved that car, but I didn't name her though. By then my eyes had diminished to such a, a point that I had difficulty driving in unfamiliar territory. So I pretty much just stayed in the neighborhood, found a place to park and partied and listened to music with my friends. I had a killer eight track player back then. So one day I drove my cousin to the Royal Farm store to buy some cigarettes. As I crept along at about 20 miles an hour, my cousin clueless to my eye problem said something like, Matt, why are you driving like you're in a funeral procession? And I said something like, I got a carburetor problem. She ain't getting enough gas now. Shut up and let me drive. But the truth was that my eyesight had deteriorated to such a degree, I couldn't drive any faster. So when I got home that day, I pulled my car into a parking spot and remembered the words of the driving instructor. Pull it over and put it in park, son. So I did. I was 19 years old, and that was the last time I ever drove. But it turned out to be a wise decision because two years later, I was diagnosed with an incurable and progressive eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa and declared legally blind. But you know what? I'm just grateful that for at least a few years, I was able to experience what it felt like to sit behind the wheel and drive, even if it probably never should have happened in the first place. Thank you. And now we'll hear Quarantine Birthday by Sierra Ferrer. Take it away, Sierra. So in telling this story, I think it's important that you all know ahead of time that my birthday is my favorite day of the whole year. I mean, there's no time that I'm more excited except for maybe Christmas, and my 24th birthday was not going to be any different. I had been planning how I was going to celebrate my birthday for weeks, probably months by this point. <clears throat> And in around December, I had made up my mind that, <clears throat> pardon me, sorry. Around December, I had made up my mind that the best way to celebrate my birthday was to get a new job. I worked in retail, I was completely miserable, and I was ready for a change. I had started my current job when I got laid off from my last one, and I had loved my last job. I sold movies, I talked about Funko Pops all day. It was a blast, and now I was selling office supplies to men older than my father who yelled at me when I didn't have a 0.3 millimeter refill for their pilot pen. Needless to say, I was unhappy, and it was time for me to go. And any of my classmates, friends, you name it, all of them had heard my plan. I, they knew that I was leaving this job and that this was the best way for me to be happy. I thought that by telling everyone around me, they would hold me accountable to this big declaration that I would finally be free of the land of office supplies. 
by January, I had hit the ground running. I was going on interviews at least two to three times a week. I was buying professional clothing. I was really looking the part, feeling the part. Things were going great. I had brushed the dust off my resume and things were going okay. And then I started getting calls back and emails back that, well, at this time we're looking for someone with more experience or we've decided to go in a different direction and so on and so forth. I'm sure you've all heard these pleasantries. But still, I had told everyone that I knew that I was getting a new job, so I was determined. We go into February and my interest starts to wane a little bit. I'm getting a little discouraged, but no, I have to do this. And then I give myself a deadline. I have to have this new job by March the 14th. And if you've ever left a job, you know that you generally, when you have manners, give a two week notice before you leave the job. So my March the 14th deadline was perfectly timed so that by March the 28th, the day before my 24th birthday, I would be free. And I am pretty hyper organized. I color code my entire life. I wrote this down in my favorite journal, in my favorite shade of blue, and I highlighted it. This was it. I had made it. I was going to do it. And then the beginning of March comes around and we start hearing reports about COVID-19 and the coronavirus. And given that I'm already riddled with anxiety most of the time, I thought I would just shove my fears about this impending doom to the back of my mind. After all, I had a plan and I had to stick to my plan. But as the date kept creeping closer and closer, it seemed like my birthday plans and my plans of getting a new job were going to be ruined. It's about March the 7th when two really interesting things happen at the same time. We are receiving word that this virus is maybe a little bit more serious than I'm giving it credit, and also that we have inventory at my current job. And I'm like, okay, no big deal, inventory, whatever. Then my boss drops the bombshell on me that our inventory is the day before my birthday. And at this point, the wheels in my mind start turning. I haven't found a new job yet. I haven't had an interview that I'm completely excited about. What if I'm still in this job by the time March the 28th rolls around? And so I'm getting nervous and I'm like, great, my plans are going to be ruined. This is it. My 24th birthday is going to be spent at this place that I hate so much. And I'm being filled with such resentment that I double down and I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to find another retail job. At least I'll be out of this environment. I start compromising with myself because this color-coded blue date in my journal will not be sacrificed for anything. And then it's about March the 10th and other universities are closing and people who live in the United States are getting the coronavirus. And I'm like, holy shit, okay, maybe this is a little bit more serious. And then four days later, my magic date, March the 14th. I don't have a new job. So by this point, I've probably reached a full-blown panic. I don't have a way out. And if I quit now, I'm not going to have any money. So then I start justifying to myself, well, of course you can quit. You deserve this. You work really hard. And three days later, we start getting reports that our campus is going to be closed for several weeks following spring break, which means that this virus is, again, more serious than I gave it credit. And two days later, so the 19th of March, my boss comes to me and tells me that she has great news for me and I'm so excited. What is it? Oh, well, our inventory has been canceled. Well, finally something is going right for me in the month of March and I'm so excited. I mean, this is the best possible plan considering I'm still going to be stuck working here. But then Governor Hogan announces that bars, movie theaters, retail stores, pretty much everything that I do in my spare time is going to be closed indefinitely. And there it is. The other shoe has dropped. So now I'm stuck at this job that I hate. I have the day off, but I can't go anywhere. And this is not at all how I thought that my 24th birthday was going to turn out. I mean, I've pl been planning it since December. So my birthday comes. March the 29th, and I am at home with the people who love me most in the world, 
and I get tons of text messages all day about how crazy it is that we're all stuck inside and everyone knows how much I love my birthday. And while it didn't go exactly according to plan, at least I'm still alive and who knows, maybe for 25 I'll throw a big bash. Thanks. Doing lunges in Qatar. So when I was, um, when I was younger, my mom had this rule in her house that we weren't supposed to wear shoes when we entered. In fact, we were supposed to leave them at the door. And of course, for my teenage self, I thought my mom was trying to control where I put my things. I can't let that happen. But really, she was trying to protect me. Because when you live in a desert climate like Qatar, sand travels through the cracks in the doors and the windows, and suddenly your house is um, a big sand block. <laughs> it's a big sandbox. Um, so I didn't listen to her and the next day um, I'm running late to school and um, I quickly grabbed my shoes from the door and I put them on in the car and I didn't just sand them out before I put them on and I'm rushing to get to school and I happened to get there right on time and I had PE first period um, and at the time my school was in collaboration with a university and we would go use their facilities and um, which meant that we would go take a 15 minute bus ride to that university and then take it back when we were done. And of course I get there exactly on time and as soon as I'm getting on the bus, I see that um, everyone is already there. And my friend commits the biggest betrayal of all time and doesn't save me a seat next to her, um, which meant that I had to sit in the jump seat, which was really just a glorified term for the aisle. <laughs> And, um, but when I was sitting in the aisle, it meant that I was the first one to get off the bus and on the bus. And, and that's exactly what happened. I was the first one to get into the gym for PE, and I loved PE. Um, I really did lunges from the heart, and I was that annoying person that um, I would overlap people in, on track. I loved PE. And right after PE, I had um, second period, which was Miss Meager's math class. Now, Miss Meager was a retired school teacher from the Minnesota public school system, and she was really strict. Um, you know, we would get on the bus to get back to our school, and we would already be counting down the minutes that we would have to get back to Miss Meager's math class. And of course, we had this unspoken rule on the bus that the seat that you came in was the seat that you were um, you were going back in. So I was back in the um, jump seat again, or the aisle. Um, but it meant that I was going to be the first person off the bus and I would have more time to change out of my gym uniform and into my school uniform. Uh, so as soon as we got to school, I jumped right off the bus, uh, went up the stairs, grabbed my things from my locker and headed to the girls' bathroom. And as I'm in there, I start by taking off my shoes and I notice that there is a stain on my sock. And I'm thinking, um, okay, maybe this just came from the wash, right? And I look a little closer and I see an antenna <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is, maybe this is from a desert spider, even though I don't even know what the anatomy of a desert spider looks like. And it actually turns out, I'm not thinking any of this, I'm saying this because my friend comes and she knocks on the bathroom door and she says, um, Russia, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I am not okay. There is a cockroach in my pumas. Um, and she's like, uh, is it dead or alive? And I'm like, it's dead because I've been stepping in it all day. And she's like, yeah, what are you going to do now, though? Are you going to throw away your socks or your shoes? And I'm like, well, I'm thinking to throw away the cockroach first and then my socks and maybe throw the shoes in the wash when I get home. And she's like, yeah, yeah. Um, but for now, what are you going to do? We have class. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I knew that my older sister... Um, who's at the same school as me, I knew that she had an extra pair of shoes in her locker. So I sent my friend down the hall to go ask my sister if I could borrow them. And my friend comes back a couple minutes later and she's like, listen, Russia, your sister says that if you bother her one more time in school, she's going to throw away all your shoes when you get home. And I'm like, yeah, that is something my sister would do. And uh, my Miss Meager sends in her um, teacher's pet at this point to remind us that we only have a couple of minutes left. And my friend says, uh, listen, Russia, I'm going to head to class, but I'll be thinking of you in there. And if I come up with something, I'll come back for you. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's fair. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, what am I going to do? Miss Meager can't, won't let me, uh, you know, uh, go to her class late and my parents have a really strict rule um, that we're not to call them at school unless it's an emergency and I knew Miss Meager was going to call them if I violated school uniform and didn't come with shoes and, and of course my parents have that rule you know don't call us unless it's an emergency um, this being life or death not the death of a cockroach and, and so I start looking through my bag um, trying to find something to, to use and I end up buying, finding a fresh pair of socks and I put them on put on my pumas put on my school uniform and rushed to class. And I ended up making it just on time. 
And of course, as soon as I got there, my friend had told everybody what happened and everyone got so excited. We talked about it for way too long. <laughs> and, um, you know, it caused so much commotion that um, it put Miss Meager's lesson plan off track, so much so that she had to cancel our surprise pop quiz for the next day. And suddenly the girl with a cockroach in her pumas became the class hero. Thank you. And now we hear from Erin Dowridge Rodney. Um, her story is Pink Hippo. It's an Etsy Chronicle. Take it away. Hello. So my mom opened Pink Hippo when I was a kid and it operated through Esty. And if you don't know, Esty is a online website where people can sell homemade arts and crafts. And my mom sold a lot of things, balloons, wedding cakes, party invitations, we dressed up in costumes, she sold candy, apples, it was great. But unfortunately, the same year that she opened this business was the same year that she broke up with my stepfather. It ended in a very explosive fight and he had his things out at the end of the week. But I thought my mom was gonna be fine because she had a philosophy that sadness and depression just didn't exist. So my sister wakes me up one particular morning and she tells me to come downstairs and we look at my mom's computer and she had just gotten 500 new orders within the last 48 hours. And I really couldn't figure out what the problem was until my sister had told me that my mom had been locked in her room for three days at this point. And I just, that's when I realized that maybe she wasn't okay. So I go upstairs and I try to talk to her and she's just ignoring me. So that's when my sister tells me that we're going to have to try and run this business by ourselves. But the problem was that I was 13 and my sister was 16. And at that age, you really can't get anything right. But we tried anyway. But there were still several problems. We were, had, we were very low on time because we were still in school. We were very low on supplies, very low on money. And we just didn't know how to make everything on the website. But that weekend when we got out of school, we went to the craft store Michaels and got as much as we could carry. And when we came home that weekend, we just sat and made orders for hours and things were going great until we started receiving a lot of very malicious emails. Because at that time, it was, it was about three weeks from Christmas and one of our most ordered items were Christmas ornaments and everybody wanted to have them so that they can put them on their Christmas tree. And even with three weeks before Christmas, they still might not have gotten them for Christmas. So we had some people asking why their order hadn't been sent out, even though there were two, our turnaround time was two days on the website. We had some people asking if they were gonna get their orders for Christmas. And then we just had some people saying that we were scammers and we were not gonna send their orders at all. And I just didn't know what to say. Like, it's hard to explain to complete strangers that, you know, your mom's just temporarily out of commission. And you know, people don't wanna hear that. They just wanna get their orders. So I didn't respond and I went on about my day. But unfortunately for me, that was the same week that our bill collector started calling, telling us that we were late on our bills. And after a couple of days, my sister just told me to stop answering the landline. And it was fine, but the problem was that our customers started complaining directly to Etsy. So Etsy sent us an email telling us that if we didn't have a certain number of orders completed by the end of the week, they were gonna shut down the shop. So me and my sister decided to host the party and we figured that if we could get all of our friends to help us that we could have all these orders completed. But the problem was they did not care nearly as much as we did. So they were putting the bows on wrong, putting the packaging on, on wrong. They were getting their handprints all over the ornaments and then some people were just breaking them. So me and my sister still wanted to keep my mother's standards. So we were nitpicking every little thing and no teenager wants to get, be nitpicked. So it started a really big argument and everybody went home. So it wasn't surprising that the next day that SC shut our shop down. But the problem was that me and my sister had spent all of our money buying supplies. So when Esty issued the refunds, my mom's account was overdrafted. So the next day when the bill collectors decided to take their money, there was nothing for them to take. 
So about three days later, our power went out. And it was the middle of winter. So my sister decided to scrape together the little bit of money that she had. And we went to a very rusty, dusty motel in security. You might have heard of it before, called Night's End. And we stayed there for about three days before my sister was able to sign us up for energy assistance. And when we came back home, the power was went back on again. And my mom came out of her room for the first time in about a month. And she didn't say anything about how she was feeling. She didn't say anything about the divorce. And to this day, we've never talked about that weekend at all. But next up, we have Martha Richinski telling her story, my writing career, AKA Coke or Pepsi. Take it away, Martha. Thanks, Erin. This is a collection of my um, stories that I wrote from childhood. I never thought I'd be grateful that my family didn't have cable. Through all of my angst and jealousy, listening to my friends talk about the Disney Channel shows they were watching, like That So Raven and Hannah Montana, I was limited to shows like Face the Nation and Everybody Loves Raymond. But this was really the jumpstart to my writing career. I would write my own Disney Channel episodes, and I came up with this show called Roberta. I'm going to share some of an episode with you today. Um, this, I'm only going to share part of the episode. I'm going to spare you all. Um, but to catch you up, Roberta forgets that it's picture day the next day. Cynthia, her best friend, reminds her. They realize they have to go to the mall to get a new outfit for picture day. Um, and of course, they use their credit cards at the mall because every eight-year-old has a credit card. Um, but yeah, I was really just fascinated with this like Disney Channel manifesto where every kid had unlimited amounts of money and unlimited amounts of freedom. This is my episode of Roberta. Together, we've got $4,000 to spend. I've got $1,000 a year from my allowance, and I saved it up for two years. Impressive, but same thing, said, Roberta, said Cynthia. Roberta's grandmother said, girls, get into the car. When they arrived, they didn't know where to start, so her grandmother suggested Great Girls Clothing Store, the limited two of this universe. How about I pick out the outfits and you try them on, said Cynthia. Okay, said Roberta. Roberta must have tried on at least over 1,000 outfits. Chapter two, surprises. All right, this is the last outfit, said Cynthia. How do I look? Great. Let's just hope the rest of the class likes it. Remember last year when you wore that cowboy outfit and did a square dance for us? <laughs> This is her flashback. Um, she's wearing the popular juicy sweatpants of the time, but of course they didn't pay for product placement, so instead they say, I love cowboys on them. That was a disaster. Well, girls, it's time to go, said Roberta's grandmother. They went to the counter and paid for it all. Your total comes to $100. Thank you. As they walked to the car, Roberta said, I want to wear my new outfit to the grocery store. Okay, said her grandmother. As they were walking, Roberta was talking to Cynthia and there was a gallon of milk in front of her and she slipped and broke her arm and that was a huge surprise. You could argue that was a terrible way to end the story or a great way to continue readership. This next story is from my Stephen King phase. Um, I wrote this at church on Thanksgiving. My dad would always bring pens and crayons to church for me. Um, I think he could sense my inner atheist, and this was like the only way to keep me sitting still. So without further ado, 
This is the thankful turkey. Once upon a time, there lived a turkey. He hated Thanksgiving because every time one of his friends would be chopped up for supper. He moaned and groaned in bed. He kept saying, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Finally, he fell asleep. His alarm clock rang at at least 8.30, but the turkey did not wake up. Instead, he woke up at nine o'clock. He said, hmm, maybe we could switch it around a little bit. He rang the town bell and gathered all the turkeys. He showed them his idea. The turkeys shook their heads and made things. The ladies made cookies and cakes and of course, pumpkin pie. So they all sat down for dinner and dessert, but instead of a turkey, they had a person. In my defense, um, I kept it on brand with the religious theme. The turkeys are sitting around Last Supper style. Of course, they are having a pilgrim's head as the main entree <laughs> on that platter there. The last thing I'll share is um, a story, well, uh, a series of questions inspired by Coke or Pepsi. This was um, a book that my friends and I found at our school Scholastic Book Fair, which I don't know if you all have ever been to one, but it's really just a pseudo book fair. They sell like spy kits for kids and pens with like special pens with ink that only kids can read. Um, yeah, so we each grade got to go um, spend time at this book fair for a couple minutes and just look at the books. But of course, we're in like seventh grade, so none of us can actually afford any of this stuff. So we're left to either steal a book, um, just read as much as we could in the allotted time, or um, you could do what my friends and I did, which was really just like, remember as much of the book as we could and then torrent it. That's exactly what we did with Coke or Pepsi. We only remembered one question, which was Coke or Pepsi. Cocaine or Pepsi? How would you describe yourself? Do you have a cat? If yes to number four, is it a boy or a girl or a baby? Baby, nameless, genderless. If yes to number four, what does it look like? If yes to number four, what brand of cat chow would you recommend? What is your favorite movie? Why? If answer was that of a porno, explain which position really took your breath away. Favorite kind of music? Favorite singer or band? Favorite thing about Catherine, my co-author? If you were Queen Latifah for eight days, what would you wear on the last day? What is your favorite class? Why? Do you like your steak rare, medium rare, or well done? What is your most embarrassing moment? Would you ever eat nachos given to you by country icon Tim McGraw? Who is someone you really look up to and what career would you want to have? I think that question's always been circling around in my mind, but here I am at University of Baltimore um, finishing my degree in English with a focus in creative writing. I'm still working on my technique and I am definitely still working on <laughs> um, my endings. But if there's one thing I know for certain, Coke or Pepsi, um, Coke, obviously. Okay, up next. We have um, Chanel Robinson performing Sons and Daughters. Hello. I'd like yeah. to tell you all about my youngest daughter. In May of 1998, I gave birth to a nine pound, seven ounce baby boy that I named Jordan. Jordan has always been very active. He, from the time he was little up until today, could never keep still, always has to be moving around, doing something. Jordan is 
the artist of my little group. She loves to draw, always has. And um, he's just been something to watch grow up. When um, Jordan turned 18, shortly after his 18th birthday, he came to me with some news that he wanted to share and a trait that he inherited from me was that um, whenever there's something that's hard to say or you're not sh quite sure how to get it out, you write it down. So he wrote me a letter. And in this letter, he's explaining that from the time he was about six or seven years old, he felt that there was something not quite right about him. Um, he ended up letting me know that he felt as though instead of being born a boy, he should have been born a girl. And my first reaction was complete shock. I'm like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? The whole time that Jordan was growing up, I never saw any sign of him wanting to be a girl, thinking he was a girl. I was just completely surprised and taken aback and had all sorts of questions and concerns. My main concern was for his safety because you hear so many stories about bad things happening to trans people. So it's been almost four years since Jordan gave me this news and we've been in therapy both together and separately and it's really been helping me to kind of understand a little bit about what happens to the individual that has to go through this transition and I still have a little bit of issues with using the different pronouns, saying she instead of he. Most of the time I say he, sometimes I catch myself. But um, it's been a process and we're getting through it. But, you know, at the end of the day, Jordan is my child. And I love my child no matter what. And the one thing that I always want her to know and understand is that no matter what life has in store for Jordan and her future, that I love her and she's got me in her corner. And as a mother of sons and daughters, it could never be any other way. And that's my story. Our next storyteller will be Daniel Galash. And Daniel is asking the question, do you think that's a good idea? All right, thanks now. So when I was in middle and high school, every summer I would get shipped off to hang out with my grandparents while my single working mom continued to work even though the babysitting services of school were now gone. So those babysitting services quickly got pawned off by my, on my grandparents who in turn pawned it right off onto all the lifeguards at the beach, um, pretty much dropping me off after breakfast and picking me up before dinner. Um, and while I kind of hung out, you know, running around, getting sunburned and bothering these lifeguards. Uh, I eventually got to the point where I knew everyone so well that it became a job I could get when I got old enough. So I started working every summer as a lifeguard at Myrtle Beach in Fort Macon, North Carolina. And one day I saw um, during a rescue situation, a orange and white helicopter come in and some badass looking people in blue and orange suits come rappelling down into the water. Uh, and I could basically hear like Van Halen in the background while I watched this. And I just thought that must be the coolest job you could ever have in your life. 
Um, so I decided right then and there, I was gonna figure out exactly how you get into the Coast Guard because that's what I was gonna do. Um, and so I went into the process of figuring things out and discovered that you could do an early enlistment. Um, and at 17 years and nine months with a parent signed off, you could get a guaranteed place in the um, officer training corps and go to college and then get shipped off. And I said, I'm definitely gonna do this. Uh, and my mom said, before I sign this, you know, Coast Guard, do you, you think that's a good idea? Uh, and I said, well, why, why wouldn't it be? Why, why wouldn't I wanna do this? It's a, it's a great job. Um, and she said, well, Coast Guard, isn't that like the military? And I was like, well, kind of, you know, I mean, it's more like, you know, firefighters, EMT, you know, kind of mixed around, you know, it's not like the military. And she's like, I'm pretty sure it's the military. And I was like, no, I, I can handle this. Yes, it's technically part of the military, but I'm going to be okay. Um, she said, all right, fine. If this is really what you want to do, I'll sign off on it. So 17 years, nine months to the day, go sign up, uh, irrevocable contract. I'm going into the Coast Guard. Uh, I get to pick my job because I'm going in early and say, I'm going to be a journalist. It's going to be great. Jumping out of helicopters, taking pictures. It's going to be awesome. Um, and then right at the end of my senior year, I think I was about 17 and 10 months, I'm walking up the stairs and I look over at the TV and I see that 9-11 is occurring. Um, and as 9-11 is occurring, the entire structure of what the Coast Guard is uh, begins to change. And as I'm going through my first year of college on ROTC and getting ready for active duty, it goes from this non-combatant journalist job to having to do things like drug interdiction and migrant interdiction uh, and things that are not quite so fun. But, you know, as I work my way up through the ranks, I finally get the chance to have my own command. And I think it's going to be different this way. I'll be able to set the tone in a different way. Yeah, my mom was right. It's military out there, but I'll be able to do this. It'll be my own little pod. Um, and one of the first problems that I had the chance to handle when I was there was the dispute over what happens with coffee cups. So I, you know, in a stroke of managerial brilliance, went and got a bunch of uh, blank coffee cups with paint markers that everyone could decorate however they wanted. And since the music that had been kind of blasting through the shop at that time had been kind of, you know, folky Joe Hill, Woody Guthrie type of stuff, everyone was writing Woody Guthrie style anti-fascist slogans on their coffee cups in the military. Um, and so they started asking questions about why people were writing those things. And in the process of that investigation, discovered that my mom ran this independent media center. And these were the high days of paranoia in the George Bush military. Um, and they decided, you know, we're just going to look into exactly whether you're in here to somehow subvert the military or do some kind of uh, media expose. And so since we have a little bit of a different law structure here called the Uniform Code of Military Justice, we're just gonna throw you in this metal box um, called the pre-confinement facility. And you're gonna hang out there while we figure out exactly what's going on. And this uh, metal box in the middle of a parking lot in Great Lakes Naval Air Station, you're gonna hang out there and you're gonna not get a calendar. You're not gonna be told what day it is. Um, you're gonna get fed once a day. You're going to shower once a day. And the rest of the time you're gonna sit there. And as my temporal lobe started to lose its grasp, I started having to mark the time by taking a tiny piece of paper and sticking it into the grate of the um, air vent. So each day could be another day on my calendar. Or I started telling myself in my head, I'm going to say the word past. And then when I do that, it will be past. And that means the time has moved past me. So I did that. And then one day as I was doing my 1,090th sit up, suddenly the door swings open and they say, all right, well, we've done the investigation. Looks like you're all in the clear. I'll go back and assume your command in Detroit. Uh, so I did that uh, and everyone was supposed to not talk about it. Like it was a totally normal way of treating it. And then I finally got the opportunity when I had capped out um, and I could no longer advance in rank. And they said, would you like to serve out the end of your time here uh, behind a desk or would you like to leave now but only get part of your benefits? And I took that opportunity. And on my last day after dropping off my uniform, I moonwalked through the gates and was finally done with the Coast Guard. Thank you. All right, thanks. And up next, we've got Michelle Hickson doing a story called The Bad Mother. Good 
me to take it in. I needed a cat for reasons I'm not going to go into. Cats are very intelligent creatures. However, they do not know the concept of a phone. They don't know that, you know, there's someone on the other end that you are talking to. When they hear your voice, they want attention. When you're on the phone, your cat hears your voice, scans the room, and when they do not see anyone else in the room, you must be talking to them. Then they, move, they mule and they demand attention. One day, this past November, uh, while my son was in school, I was, um, I was on the phone on a business call involving a personal matter. Reninja, that's the cat's name, uh, he's named after a Pokemon Reninja, uh, he's a Reninja and a Pokemon. Anyway, he was aware that my son was in school and knew that we were home alone. He heard me talking on the phone, he jumped up and beside me and started mewling for attention. I tried to ignore him, but after a, while, after a minute, it became irritating. Now remember, cats sound like babies when they're mewling. So you can imagine how much it sounded to the person on the phone when I turn around and go, will you be quiet? I then talked to the woman and said, you know, can we uh, resume our conversation? And she was like, well, maybe they're hungry. I'm like, he's not hungry. This food right there on the floor. If he's too lazy to crawl his butt over and get it, then that's on him. She was like, oh my. She has to say something that says, um, maybe you should um, attend to your business with your baby. Once again, whew, right over my head. Just to let you know, cats are considered fully grown at 18 months. Really just three years old. I tell her, oh yeah, he's my baby. But at three years old, he's just as grown as you and I. There was a moment of silence. She tells me that it's best that we conclude our business later at another time and that I should be focused on providing care and attention to someone in my home rather than the business that I was pursuing on the phone. I'm thinking, well, that she's talking about my son. I'm like, well, I do take care of my son. And his school and his therapist and everyone else that, that knows me can verify that. Miss, I take very good care of my son. And what does this have to do with this conversation not that it's any of your business. And she goes, well, right now he's hungry and you refuse to feed him. Let alone you got him eating off the floor. <laughs> I then realized that she was talking about my cat and started laughing. I said, miss, my son is in school. The mule that you hear on the, that you hear me is my cat trying to get my attention. And she burst out laughing and so did I. She said she used to have a cat and that, she, that they do sound like babies when they're mewling. So after a few more chuckles, we were able to carry on our conversation and conclude our business. Thank you. And next up, we have Jessica Cole and her story is, this is the ladies room. Jessica, go, take it. I have been asked to leave the women's restroom in four countries. France and Germany were pretty polite about it, but the other two, not so much. Now look, I have short hair. I wear men's clothes. Some days I wear makeup, other days I don't. And often I wear a ball cap. Now you might be asking yourself why this matters. And the truth is that it doesn't and it shouldn't. But there is one time when this matters very much. And that is when I have to go to the restroom. I was on my very first date with my now ex-wife at Cheesecake Factory in Columbia, Maryland. Things were going pretty well when I made the mistake of getting up to go to the restroom. At Cheesecake Factory, there is a narrow hallway. You have to pass the men's room to get to the ladies. Now I was walking feeling pretty good about myself when I noticed the click of high heels behind me but I didn't think much of it. But as I passed the men's room, I noticed a quickening click. Click, 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 click. Sir, sir, I kept walking. I made it exactly one step into a packed bathroom when a firm hand landed on my shoulder. Excuse me, this is the ladies room. The entire restroom went silent. I turned 
And in a voice loud enough for everyone to hear, I said, I know I am a lady. Why, yes, yes, you are a pretty one. And she hugged me. It was one of the strangest bathroom tales of my history. Things don't always end so amicably. In 2017, I boarded a plane bound for Afghanistan. In the previous six months, I had gone through a bitter but quick divorce, had handed over the keys to my marital home, and had lost my position as a parent for the second time. Suffice it to say, there were too many ghosts in Maryland for me to stay, so I did what any rational human would do and took a job in a war zone. I had been awake for nearly two days straight when we landed in Kuwait International Airport. They herded us Americans into a holding area while they processed our visas. All of a sudden, my stomach began to gurgle, and I thought, oh, no. The Welcome to Kuwait bubble guts had struck, and I was in desperate need of a restroom. I found an opening in the hall where you can go left to go to the men's room or right to go to the women's. I went right. I returned to my seat. But I wasn't there long when a second wave of sickness rolled over me. This time, though, before I could get in the women's restroom, I was stopped by the sound of a booming voice yelling in Arabic behind me. I turned to face an angry man, wagging his finger in self-righteous indignation between my face and the women's restroom sign. I didn't know what he was saying, but... I knew what he was saying. I started pointing at myself, saying female, woman, lady, in a kind of mantra I hoped would save me. But he just kept screaming. I returned to my seat, exhausted, defeated. I thought that it was over. But then a male security guard came up and sneered, you, come with me. He escorted me to the police station where the angry man stood, still seething, my very existence, the most heinous offense. He was recounting the story of what had happened, again in a language I did not speak. They called over a female officer and I understood I was going to be strip search. I thought I was gonna be arrested. I didn't know what my rights were. I was scared shitless. I pulled my passport out of my pocket and pointed to the letter F under sex. I said, female, woman, lady. It was my last defense. It was my only defense. Finally, the female officer seemed to understand she turned and began translating to the men who sneered at me in disgust. One of them said, go sit down. That was the end of it. After a year in Afghanistan, I returned home and began working in my old office. Not long after, a woman named Tressa began to work there too. And I first noticed her because she couldn't quit noticing me. She was staring a hole in my head. Now, having been in a war zone for a year will toughen your skin, but it'll shorten your fuse too. I didn't take shit from anyone and I wasn't about to start with her. So I turned and met her gaze square in the eye. She said, I'm sorry, I just, you see, my daughter wants to get her hair cut short like yours, and I'm taking her to the stylist this weekend, but I don't really know what I'm doing. Can you give me some pointers? Tressa and I became friends that day. I smiled and gave her precise instructions. A week later, she came in with a photo of her kid looking so proud with that fresh new do. A couple weeks later, Tressa came in to work, visibly upset. I asked her what was wrong, and she said she had gone to McDonald's with her kids over the weekend, 
and her child had returned to the table in tears. Some girls in the bathroom had yelled, you're a boy and you had better get out. She said, what do I do, Jess? What do I tell her to do when this happens? And she said, when, not if. We both knew it would happen again. You know, it broke my heart. It's one thing for me to have to defend myself. I am a grown ass human. But this little eight year old kid who doesn't even know who they are yet, who just needs to pee, already has to defend herself against people who want to tell her where she can and cannot go. That was the day I decided to quit apologizing for the way I look. Because they were little short haired girls, effeminate boys, and a hundred other humans in the making who need to see and hear that they are not alone. So public service announcement. The next time you see someone in the restroom whose genitals you think might not match the sign on the door, do me a favor. Mind your own damn business. They know better than you do. And please, don't forget to wash your hands. I hope you've gotten it all and everybody's been really great. I just wanna compliment my, my students, Matt, your wonderful clarity and your complete lack of self-pity have enchanted us all semester. Um, Sierra, once again, your immediacy and your warmth came through 100%. Rasha, your engaging and striking presence and your quirky nostalgia about your past always is wonderful to hear. Aaron, your voice, your wonderful voice and your understated revelations about your life uh, always draw us in. Marta, the adorable irony of that story and the others that you've told us and so clear that you were gonna be a writer from the word go. Chanel, um, I know everybody was moved by your courage and your vulnerability. Daniel, from the day he walked in the room, his power and polish as a storyteller has been manifest. Michelle, I'm sure is going viral on YouTube right now. <laughs> and uh, Jessica. Jessica's been a teacher to all of us. She's such a natural storyteller with such a big heart and such wonderful stories. Um, it's been an honor to me to have these students in my class. So take your five minute break. It's um, 8.01, we'll be back at 8.06 with um, eight more stories and I hope you can stay with us. And I really thank all the people that are here for being with us. Have, have a nice break. Our next storyteller is Beth Fan, and her story is called Three Letter Word. Hi everyone. So I wouldn't say that I peaked in high school because I like to have hope for the future, but as far as life accomplishments go, two things that I'm very proud of occurred in high school. One, that I was the editor-in-chief for my school paper, The Howl, my junior and senior year. I was convinced I was gonna be the next big name in journalism, but that was before I learned that the AP Style Guide doesn't require the use of the Oxford comma. And two, that I started the Gay Straight Alliance, or the GSA, for my school. Now, if there's anything you should know about me, it's that I don't like to be in the spotlight at all or the center of attention. So the fact that I took on these two positions should tell you a lot about me. Um, I was very passionate about my roles and I wanted to succeed, um, especially my senior year, the year before I went off to college. And I think I managed to do that. Um, we had a few pretty big spreads in the paper that year and I started a no hate campaign for my school. Um, so I designed flyers that would be hung up in the hallways and in teachers' classrooms that promoted um, a safe and positive community. My biggest cheerleader was Mr. Only, who was my journalism teacher, my English teacher, and the only teacher who would allow me to use their classroom during lunch for my GSA meeting. And we were close ever since he became my teacher in the 10th grade, and I knew that I could come to him with anything and that he would always support me. 
So the year is 2013. And like I said, I was a senior in high school. And one day I'm sitting in a statistics class, definitely not paying attention, doodling in my notebook, waiting for lunch, as high schoolers do. And I overhear a conversation taking place in the front of the classroom among a group of boys and my stat teacher. And they're all joking around and laughing very loudly. And I overhear one boy and he says, dude, you're such a girl. And I think, oh, well, that's annoying. But then my stat teacher jumps in and he says something that completely freezes me. And he says, yeah, man, don't be such a... And then he uses this three letter word. It's a derogatory term um, that begins with the letter S used towards gay people and I am completely frozen and so many things in that moment are running through my head um, as a student I couldn't believe that my teacher somebody who I thought was supposed to guide and act as an example would use that kind of language and as a child I thought that this adult should know better and as a bisexual person, I felt very unsafe and uncomfortable. And of course, all the boys get such a kick out of this and they're all laughing and screaming together. And my stat teacher is laughing with them. Part of me wanted to get up and shout and tell them how wrong that is. But the other part of me didn't want to make a scene. So I sat there quietly, tried to do my work, but as soon as the bell rang, or as soon as the bell rings, I hop up and I run to Mr. Only's classroom. Everything that happens next is kind of a blur because I was just crying uh, uncontrollably. But I remember Mr. Only getting very upset, um, so much that he calls our principal down to his classroom so that I can tell the principal what happened. And so the principal comes and I tell him, and in, in retrospect, I don't know what I wanted to happen to my stat teacher, but I just knew that I couldn't keep this inside. And my, stat, my, my principal understands this, and he says that he takes, he'll take care of it. And it wasn't until later that I realized that I was scared of my stat teacher, and I was scared of his reaction. And I was scared because all of a sudden, this was a thing, and I hated things, and I typically tried to avoid things. So I'm sitting with Mr. Only, who is trying to calm me down, and he's telling me that he's proud of me and that I should be proud of myself because what I did was not an easy thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. So the next day, I'm on my way to stat, and I'm terrified. I don't know if my teacher's going to be there. I'm afraid of if he is. I don't know if he knows that it was me who told. I don't know if any of the students know what happened, but I am scared. So I walk into the classroom and he's there. He doesn't look at me. I don't look at him. I just walk straight to my desk and I sit down. So um, he starts passing around or getting up to pass around work for us to start on. And the bell rings, students are coming in. No one's saying anything, so I think that I'm in the clear. But as my stat teacher starts getting closer and closer to my desk, this scene pops into my head of my teacher just absolutely berating me and condemning me, saying, oh, I know you told. How dumb. What a snitch. Who cares? It's just a word. Obviously, I didn't need to be a staff member on the paper to know that it was just a word. and. That situation doesn't happen, but he's getting closer and closer to my desk, and I don't know if I should say something or just ignore it, or if he'll say something, and it feels like I'm gonna throw up. But then I think of no hate, and I think of Mr. Only's words, and I think, I don't care if this guy knows it was me. In fact, I want him to know it was me. He should know it was me. He deserves he should be punished for what he said. 
And in that moment, I'm not afraid to be the center of attention and in the spotlight. So finally, my stat teacher gets to my desk, he hands me my work, and I look him straight in the eye. Thank you. Um, so next, with a very unique perspective on the current time, performing the end of the world, we have Tatiana Huang. Thank you so much, Beth. Okay, so this is my story, which arose at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so Saturday, February 29th, leap day, I tell my husband our marriage is over. By Friday, March 13th, I sign the lease on this big airy apartment in Falls Point on the corner of Broadway and Alisana, right in the thick of things. I couldn't have asked for better, honestly. It's got these beautiful high wooden ceilings and oversized windows that look out over the market and down the main strip of bars on Broadway. Like, I'm directly across the street from a bar that's been my sanctuary for years. I'm right next to work. I can wave at my boss for my fire escape when he steps out on his balcony for a midnight cigarette. I've always wanted to live in Fells Point. I've wanted to stumble back to my own place long after last call instead of crashing on someone else's couch. So I'm flying high. Things are going well. Sure, the separation was messy and was only gonna get messier. But the important thing was I was going to be where I wanted to be, who I wanted to be. And I thought to myself, man, what an auspicious fucking beginning to my life as a divorcee. Finally, I was getting out of the suburbs and back to the city, back to the bar life. After nearly eight years in a relationship that made me feel trapped more often than it made me feel happy, I was ready for freedom. And then it's March 16th, and Governor Hogan puts out that executive order. All bars and restaurants must close by five o'clock. It's about noon, and I'm home packing my stuff when I see this on my Facebook feed. Everyone's freaking out, of course, and I'm freaking out. My soon-to-be ex is home, too, and I feel suddenly frantic, like the way I imagine my cat feels when he knows I'm about to shove him in the carrier and take him to the bed. The last thing I was going to do was get shut in with my soon-to-be ex without so much as a goodbye to what was supposed to be my new life. So I throw as many boxes in my car as I can, and I finish putting on my face, and soon I'm careening down the freeway to get to the bars before they close. I find parking right outside my new apartment, and I huff and puff up the stairs a few times, and I manage to move all the boxes from the back seat, and I'm like, whatever good enough. By then, it's just shy of three o'clock, and I go to cross the street to the bar, and I see someone outside who I've been half avoiding, half hoping to run into. <laughs> this guy with the letters GOP tattooed on his ass. He's not a Republican, don't worry. I give him a little shrug, and I wave. I see the oh shit look in his eyes. You see, this guy, he's my favorite person to make bad decisions with and to make a mess of. And we're two highly volatile people who are way too game for anything. And I go into the bar and it's crazy busy. Everyone's trying to get in their last few hours of fun drinking before it turns into sad, lonely drinking in our respective homes. People can feel the end of the world looming. And make, mo make no mistake, for industry people like us, this is the end of the world. The bar owner is drunk off his ass and pouring free bows for regulars, and I order a drink, wait to see if the guy walks back in or just hops on his bike and flees. Sometimes when he's trying to be good, he does that, and I respect that because I know I'm a force of nature after a few too many drinks. And the last time we were together, he got wasted, I got wasted, and he got all in his feelings, and he said some things that I know he wishes he could take back. But he comes in, he makes eye contact, and I slip away from this neighborhood bartender with too few front teeth who's trying to commiserate. And I sidle up to the guy with a GOP ass tattoo, and I say, hey, asshole, can I buy you a shot? And I can see he's pretty many beers deep, so I order a shot of Malort for him and a shot of gin for me. And his face lights up 
because I know what he drinks because we have too much history to let drunk confessions fuck this up and we're comfortable again. We're friends. Like he, like me, like basically everyone we know just worked his last shift for God knows how long. So I offer him 20 bucks to take the rest of my boxes up to my apartment for me. And I know what he's thinking. And I also know that's not going to happen today. I'm not trying to christen my apartment with him of all people. We step out for a cigarette and he tells me about this engaged girl at work he's been messing around with, tells me he needs to be a good boy right now and I'm relieved. And at the same time, disappointed because if there was anyone I'd want to spend the end of the world with, I think it would be him. I'm not in love, it's absolutely nothing like that. Like, I don't like him as anything other than a friend, but he's about as much of a degenerate as I am, and we share the same proclivity for self-destruction, and I've never had to explain myself. So he's always been able to keep up, and there aren't many people who can do that. And I'm disappointed, but all right. I'm kind of happy for him because he's clearly smitten. I toss my cigarette, and he tosses his. We talk a little while longer and go back for another round. I have a drink and he has one and a half because he's realizing how drunk he is now. And he still has to take those boxes up the stairs for me. He asks for a ride home and I say, sure, tell him the boxes aren't a big deal. Just get them next time. But he insists because he says he's a man of his word. And I know that's not true, but I admire the conviction. I close this out and we leave and I light another cigarette. And instead of lighting another for himself, he plucks mine from my fingers and the moment our hands touch, I feel the mood shift. I look over to him and he looks at me and he asks me if I want to spend the end of the world together and I do, but he's so drunk and I drive him back to his place after he takes my boxes up and I drop him off because I realize my new life is only beginning and that the world is always ending and that tomorrow the world will still be ending. And I have all the days ahead of me to watch it with someone who I more than maybe like. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have On a Heart with Little Pineapple. Thank you, Tatiana. So I used to have this boyfriend who called me Little Pineapple. And he said this was uh, because I was tough on the outside, but sweet on the inside. But I wasn't always like that. I used to be more of a peach. I was soft on the outside, and I had this thin skin that was easily bruised. You see, I grew up in Belgrade, Yugoslavia in the 1980s, which was a pretty homogenous environment. We were a communist. So on the surface, at least, everyone appeared to be a good comrade, a decent person, brother, and a friend. I was raised as an only child. And even though my parents separated when I was three, I always felt loved and cherished. I had this great big extended family that cared for me and a terrific group of friends that I was really close to. We had all grown up together in the same neighborhood from preschool all the way through elementary school. I was taught to be very polite and to always respect my elders, but I was also told that I was smart and that what I had to say mattered. So it was a safe and nurturing environment. I was but doing that on top of your, oh my God. All of that came to an abrupt end when I turned 12 years old and my parents told me they were sending me away to a boarding school. Now, my country had erupted in civil war two years before. And even though the fighting hadn't reached Belgrade yet, we were suffering the fallout from the conflict. So there were bread and milk and gasoline shortages. There were, um, electricity and heating restrictions. Um, there was a high unemployment rate. People were rioting in the streets and there was also a draft and young men were being sent away to fight this war. And on top of all of that, there was a kind of overhanging threat that one of the Western powers would get involved 
and just bomb us uh, in order to stop the conflict. So my parents told me that they were concerned for my safety and that's why they were sending me away. And the boarding school was in Israel and the whole thing was organized through the Jewish Community Center of Belgrade, the JCC, which was an institution that I loved. Uh, I had grown up going to holiday celebrations there and I had a ton of friends there. We would all go to summer camp together every year. Um, so I was excited to go. I thought it was gonna be an adventure. It's gonna be like summer camp, but you know, it would just last the whole year. <laughs> but when I got to Jerusalem that summer, I was in for a rude awakening because the kids that I knew from Belgrade were very few. There was maybe 10 of us and there were dozens and dozens and dozens of children I had never seen before from the other Yugoslav republics that we were at war with. It also turned out that most of the kids were 14 years and older. It was kind of a boarding school high school and I happened to be 12 so I was one of the youngest there. So it was a really wild environment to just get kind of dropped in. Um, all of a sudden I was being bombarded with exposure to all these things I had never been around. There were kids there who smoked cigarettes and who drank vodka and who cussed and who skipped class. And there were kids who shoplifted chocolates from the supermarket and kids who snuck out of the boarding school uh, to ask random people on the street for spare change. Not because they were hungry, but just because they wanted to buy smokes or snacks or whatever. And of course there were bullies there who would literally eat the food off your plate if you happen to get up during one of the meals and who would barge into your room and take your favorite pair of LA gear pump sneakers and your copy of The Hobbit and you would never see them again. And bullies who would sneak into your room and steal your diary and read it aloud in front of everyone in the boarding school. We also managed to recreate all of the divisions that were fueling the conflict back home. So in this place that was a thousand miles away from the civil war in Yugoslavia, in this place that was supposed to be our safe haven, we weren't Jewish, but we were Serbian or Croatian or Bosnian and Kids use ethnic slurs on each other and everyone blamed each other for being there and every group hated the other group because nobody really wanted to be there and everyone just wanted to go back home. That year I reached every 12 year old girl milestone you can think of. So I smoked my first cigarette and I had my first kiss and I had my first boyfriend. I shaved my legs for the first time. I got my heart broken for the first time. I got my first period. I bought my first bra and I even masturbated for the first time. And throughout all of that, I kept begging my parents just to return me home. But they wouldn't hear it, they wouldn't budge. Um, they just didn't understand. They thought whatever I was going through couldn't possibly be as bad as what was happening back home. So I had to find other ways to survive. And eventually I ended up adapting because I realized that being myself only got me uh, picked on and bullied and laughed at. So I ended up slowly growing this kind of tough exterior, this shell. And I hid my true self deep, 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 deep inside. And I wouldn't expose myself, my true self, to anyone at any cost. After a year in Israel, I ended up 
returning home to Belgrade. But even so, I found it really difficult to shed this shell that I had grown. It was as if world was finally exposed to me for what it really was, this cruel, unforgiving place. And I just didn't feel safe being myself in it. So I stayed that way for a better part of two decades until I realized that it was impossible to form genuine human connections unless you were willing to be vulnerable. So if you see me around and I'm not smiling or I seem mean or I sound abrupt, please be patient with me because I'm still working on shedding my pineapple skin and getting back to my true self. Thank you. And next up is Roland Daniels with a story about a character named Jack. You're muted. Turn the mute off. Let's start off. Jack Shackleford was a character, if there ever was a character. Jack was a, an accountant by day and a neighborhood bookkeeper and tax repair by night. He was probably in his early 50s or, or, or 60s, uh, slim built and uh, athletic in appearance. Jack was a character though. And what made him a character was he assumed the different postures. He would wear a smoking jacket, but he didn't smoke. Um, he, he would have a pipe, but he didn't have pipe tobacco. He, he wanted to assume this character at all times. Jack had heard about my sailboat uh, and the ventures that friends had had on the sailboat and had persuaded me to take him sailing. Um, I agreed uh, reluctantly, because uh, I could imagine what a day on the water would be like with Jack. But uh, I agreed to do it, but I, it, I didn't have a crew, and I did need at least one other person to help me sail the boat, to, to get it away from the pier and to bring it back into the pier. Uh, and and I, I brought, Jack along, and just the two of us were going to sail the boat. And instead of doing any major sailing, we were going to just go to, out and motor around the harbor. But I explained to Jack, coming in, he, I, I needed his help. I needed him on the front of the boat, on, on what co was called the bow line. Uh, uh, and he, he would take this rope and step off the boat onto the pier and uh, and cleat it so that the boat would stop and, of course, not hit the front of the pier. Uh, it, this was something that probably a, a, an eight-year-old kid could do uh, if, if they followed the instructions. But um, Jack told me he, he, he was able to do that. Um, and I, I, I was very uh, meticulous in telling him how to do it. And he needed about five feet of rope uh, in order to step off and still hold the boat and, and still be on the pier. Uh, <clears throat> but if, 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 if he didn't have enough rope, you can imagine what happened if he stepped off and he didn't have enough rope to make it to the, the pier. Um, so we're coming in and I'm telling Jack, Jack, wait, 
wait. Uh, I'll tell you when to step off. You don't have to jump, just step off. We get close to the pier and uh, we're, we're just, I'm just about to tell him to step off and all of a sudden I hear brumbling, boom, 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 boom. And Jack has already taken his leave and he didn't have enough rope to make it to the pier. So he, he was caught in, in the middle and, and he was caught between the boat and, and the pier. And he, of course, was in the water. I got out and we saved the boat without uh, any harm to the boat and uh, no harm to Jack either. We got him out of the water. And he, he, he told me, he thought I was about to say, uh, step off. Uh, and and he, he, he just figured he could leap that little wave. But I guess he didn't think that he didn't have enough rope to leap that way. And um, so he, 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 he got caught at the end and not having enough rope to make it to the end. But he told me <clears throat> that he learned his lesson and, and he, he thought that if, if I would take him sailing again, he, he, he could do his part he, and he wanted to do it. And Jack was persuasive and um, so I agreed to do it. We got him dried off and then the next morning we went out and we motored around the, the harbor again. Um, and and the, again, um, Jack was on the bow in the front of the boat. And this time he told me he was listening. And I, I just had to tell him when to step off. And I told him, you don't need to jump, Jack. All you have to do is step off, you know. And um, we're coming in to the pier and I'm going as slow as the boat can go. And uh, we're just creeping along. And I'm, I'm going to tell him, Jack, just step off. And I'm about to say, Jack, just step off when all of a sudden I hear it again. <laughs> and there's Jack in the water again. He, he didn't have enough rope to make it to, to the pier again. And he was caught between the boat and the pier and in the water again. And uh, uh, and I, I went to, to look down to see that, that, that he was there and he was explaining to me why he did it again. And, and if there was any moral to the story, you know, it was that, you know, if Jack didn't have it naturally, if he, then he wasn't likely to get it uh, any other way because he couldn't understand how, how to follow that one instruction to get, get the boat uh, landed. And uh, next we have uh, Kyla Kulinet with not a fairy tale. Hi everyone. Thank you, Roland, for that great introduction. Um, I wanted to tell a story about when I was in high school. So as kids, we always watch those Disney princess movies and you always see them get the Prince Charming at the end. And so that, what that taught me was that there was always going to be a guy out there that was going to catch me and uh, sweep me off my feet. And he was going to be my Prince Charming. And my senior year of prom, I met my Prince Charming. And I had been, prom was special because I had been dumped about a week before prom by the boyfriend I was with for a couple months. And I didn't really like that guy, but the fact that I had him during the spring semester, I was like, oh, we're going to go to prom. It's going to be great. I'll have an actual date to prom, which I'd never had before. And he had dumped me and decided he was going to go with someone else and wasn't going to buy my ticket and wasn't going to take me to dinner. So I had to figure that out all on my own. I had already bought the dress and it was a floor length fuchsia rhinestone covered dress. And I felt really beautiful in it. I was super excited. And so I decided, all right, well, I'm going to figure it out on my own. I'm going to make prom work. And so I get my ticket. I scrounge up the $45. I find dinner plans with other friends and I get ready to go to prom. I get there and everything is perfect. It's exactly how I imagined. I'm just deciding I'm going to have a good time. Screw those boys. And I'm about halfway through the night. I spin around and I bump into this, this guy and his, his I'm short, I'm only five foot, and I look up, and he's this tall, dark, handsome man that I've never seen before, and in his tux, he looks like Prince Charming, and I bump into him, and he, and I start, say I'm sorry, 
And I start to walk away. I like, oh, I didn't mean to bump into you. And he says, oh, you want to dance? And I'm like, oh, of course I want to dance. I've never been asked to dance before. And so long story short, we dance the rest of the night together. He teaches me salsa and we have a wonderful night. Um, I go home about four in the morning and I write in my diary and I have it right here. Um, I met someone at prom of all places. He goes to Mountain Range. It's a different high school in my district. Um, his birthday is June 12th. He's agnostic. We have basically the same beliefs. He loves soccer and artistic and cute. OMG cute. And I was smitten from that first night. He was too. And we started dating and having a really great relationship. We hung out as often as we could. We didn't live very far apart. And um, that spring, we both graduated high school. I was set to go to Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is about an hour outside of where we lived in Denver. And we were gonna stay in a relationship. Um, I had decided that I was going, that I was in love with him, that he was everything I ever wanted. He was my man, he was my Prince Charming, and I was gonna do anything I needed to to keep him and to make him happy. And so, because he couldn't drive, I would drive down every weekend and come pick him up and we would keep, I'd drive him back to my dorm and we'd hang out for the weekend. And then Monday morning, I'd do the four hour round trip back. And I would do this probably two or three times a month. And sometimes I would, you know, miss classes or not do homework because I was spending too much time with him. And as our relationship progressed, I, things started to happen that I wasn't exactly okay with. Um, before I started college, we had, I'd lost my virginity to him and it was great. It was everything I'd wanted. It was, I was happy, but then things started to change where he would grope me when I wasn't wanting to be groped or he'd guilt me into having sex with him. And, and sometimes he would even, you know, not stop when I told him to stop. And he, and I always thought that, okay, this is, this is how it's supposed to be. I'm trying to be a good girlfriend. I'm letting him do this because I'm a good girlfriend. I'm trying to be what I'm supposed to be. And about three years later, I end up breaking up with him for other reasons, mostly because he wasn't there for me. He never was there for me, like I was there for him. And I didn't realize what was happening to me with, between me and him was abuse until years later. And I had realized that it wasn't right, even though we were a couple, that it wasn't consent unless I actually gave consent and was okay with it, and that it was actually sexually assault. And so it wasn't until the Me Too movement really started go getting going last year that I realized that it was wrong. And so it's important to tell this type of story because I'm still healing from this experience, he, I'm still trying to take back everything that he took from me. I have a, a warped sense of what a good sexual relationship is or even what love is. I haven't been able to keep a loving relationship over the last, that was six years ago. And um, it's been really hard. It's trying to rebuild the definition of who you are after someone who you gave everything to at such a young age takes it from you. And so it's important to tell this story because it's not only a story about young love, it's a story about sexual assault and sexual assault with, within a relationship and how that can be something that's a little more complicated or air, gray area than what a straight sexual shot or rape would be. And so my message to everyone is that listen to those Me Too stories and know that it, this type of thing happens and it's important. And if it has happened to you, you tell your story too, because likely it's been something that's, it's unfortunately common. And so it's not always Prince Charming. Thank you. Up next, we have Roberta Gore with St. Gen Saint Genesius and me. <laughs> I unmuted myself. Good evening. I'd like to begin by telling you about this person named Genesius. 
he was a Roman performer in the third century AD. And um, he was on stage one day and he was performing his scene and it was a baptism and he was kind of parroting a baptism and um, had this revelation and became a Christian and became a saint and became Saint Genesius. So fast forward, what, 2000 years. Um, when I was in college, I was a theater major and our director, every time we had a show, had us all join hands. And when we joined hands, we would say a prayer and then he would say Saint Genesius and we would all scream out at the top of our lungs, pray for us. And I thought that was nice. So I graduated from college and I became a teacher. Um, in 1982, I became a teacher at North Carroll High School in Hampstead, Maryland. And my first play was You Can't Take It With You in November of 1982. And at that first play, I introduced this tradition and I gathered all my students around me and said words of joy and hope. And then I screamed out, St. Genesius! And all my students, so that we could blow the roof off the school, screamed, pray for us! And so a tradition was born. Years passed. In the fall of 1986, I was 28 years old, and it was an opening night, and it was daytime. I was in my classroom teaching a class, and a student walked into my room, a student aide, and this person had an envelope. And on the envelope was one of those little mailing labels and typed onto the mailing label was to Roberta from St. Genesius. That's weird. So I opened the envelope and inside were two sheets of paper. One was a letter and it said to Roberta and I read the whole letter and it was this beautiful, kind, hopeful letter telling me all these nice things. And then at the end of the letter, the person typed, love St. Genesius. The second sheet of paper was to the cast and crew and it was a poem and it was a funny poem. It was a jokey poem. There were all these inside jokes referring to our production. And at the end of the poem, the person typed, I will be watching you from my front row in the heavens. Love, St. Genesius. So I was very befuddled. I ran out of my room, ran to the main office, interrogated everybody in the office. The secretary said, Roberta, it was so busy in here. I have no idea who gave me that letter. I would like to mention there was nobody in there at the time. So that happened in the fall of 1986. It is currently May of 2020. That's 34 years ago. In all those 34 years, I have gotten a letter from St. Genesius every opening night. No lie. In the 80s, he used a typewriter. In the 80s, he also misspelled his name. He spelled his name Genesis, but that's okay. In the 90s, he converted to some kind of word processor. And then as we ushered in the 21st century, he must have bought himself a computer. He also became very theatrical in the 21st century. And when I directed Les Miserables, he wrote the letter on this flag. When I directed Jekyll and Hyde, he wrote the letter on this green fabric, like bubbling out of this vase. I had no idea who this was. I, I, I did a lot of research. I analyzed it a lot. Um, at one point, I had um, a, a faculty member who had been in a faculty play say to me, Roberta, I think what we should do is set up a camera in the back of your classroom and then we'll catch him. Obviously, I had theories. I have a lot of theories. It, it, it couldn't possibly have been one person because we're talking about a span of 34 years. Um, and it was someone who was at rehearsal. It was somebody who actually knew what was going on. Bottom line, I never found out who St. Genesius was. Um, anyway, in 2016, my school closed, which is a whole other story. The, fall, the, the Flight of the Lawn Chairing Man was our final show, our final musical. 
and I received a letter from St. Genesius, and in the letter he wrote, I honestly do not know if my letters will be able to reach you in the future. And he wrote a lot of other really nice things, but I had every reason to believe this was it. Truly, everybody, one important detail is that I never got a letter from him anywhere else, and I've directed elsewhere. He, he never wrote to me during summer theater or if I was doing a community show. The only place I ever got a letter from St. Genesius was at North Carroll. It was like he belonged there. So I was sure this was it. I truly was. And at the end of that year, I made this magnanimous statement to my students. I hope if he does continue, I hope he goes with you. And they were like, oh, no, Miss Gore, he should go with you. And I was like, oh, no, he should go with you. Anyway, um, in the fall of 2016, so now I have moved to a new school. It's on the other side of the county. My students have moved five miles from North Carroll. And it's early November. And one day I'm teaching class and my phone starts madly vibrating. I run and I get my phone and I look and my former students are writing me like 50 million texts saying, he came, he came, he delivered his letter. It's our opening night and he remembered us. And I was so happy for them. And I was so sad for me. Um, two weeks later, I was in my classroom and it was a Friday, it was our opening night at my new school. And I'm sitting at my desk with my planning mod and all of a sudden I heard this swoosh and I looked over to the door and there was this envelope on the floor, like right next to the door. And I jumped up and I ran to the door and I leaned over and picked up the envelope. It was from St. Genesius. So then I ran to the hall, I looked up and down the hall, the hall was completely empty. I'd like to close by talking about my final best correspondences. Once in my life, one single time in my life, he did not write to me um, on an opening night. Um, he wrote to me when both of my parents died. In 2014, my uh, mother died and a beautiful bouquet of flowers was delivered to the funeral parlor with a card that said, sometimes people leave you halfway through the woods, but you are not alone. Truly, no one is alone. St. Genesius, that's from Into the Woods. Two years later, in the fall of 2016, my dad passed away, like right when I was starting at this new school. I got a beautiful bouquet of flowers and a card, and the card read, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. I hope this helps you say goodbye one last time. St. Genesius. That is from Hamilton. So I guess for many, many years, this was like the great whodunit to me. This was like the big mystery in the sky story. It just doesn't matter who he is. There is a person or an entourage who have loved me for a lifetime. And my story it's a love story from St. Genesius to me. Thank you. Next up, our family. Next up, we have Jordan Robinson, and she will be starring in Bank Robbery to Boredom. <laughs> Hi, so I'm going to be telling my story. Thank you, Roberta, for introducing me called Bank Robbery or Boredom. I'm going to play a little video um, that I had recorded earlier today.
So you said you can't hear me. I'm trying to work it out. Sorry. <laughs> Jordan, yeah. um, it's me, it's Marion. Um, do you feel okay to just tell the story live because um, it wasn't working and we could hear you when we, when you talk? Sure, um, I figured it was, we were having some technical difficulties. Okay. So, this is called Bank Rivalry at Boredom. Uh, I worked at a bank for four years and I never liked telling people I worked at a bank because they always asked me random questions about banking that I didn't know the answer to. Um, no, I don't know why Amazon keeps withdrawing money from your account. It's probably because you keep buying things. No, I don't know anything about interest rates, investments, or insurance. I was an English major. I don't know how to help you save money. So please do not ask me, okay? But, there I was a banker for four years. And people would also ask me, hey, have you guys, have you ever been robbed before? And I'll have to say, yes, I have been robbed before. And no, it is not thrilling. It's not exciting like the movies. The first time I experienced a robbery, I had been working at a branch for two years. And I remember the day, it was a beautiful summer, afternoon and the breeze was blowing and guess what i was stuck inside at my desk with a customer helping her figure out what an overdraft fee was so in the middle of me helping this customer i see two guys walk in the branch now, i noticed them because my desk is closer to the door and I can see who's coming and going. So I see these two guys walk in and they're wearing black on a hot summer day. It's about 2 p.m. and they're wearing black in the heat of the day. One is tall and one is short. The tall one has an afro that looks like a dirty Q-tip and the short one has a Ravens jersey on that's like 10 sizes too big for his stumpy brain. So these two silly people walk inside the branch like nothing is wrong and they get in the toilet line. Now I'm used to seeing strange people in the branch. I think when you work in the atmosphere, like in a bank, you're used to seeing all sorts of characters. So I pay it no mind and I turn back to my customer and I talk to her. Not five minutes later do I see them rush out of the branch and my phone rings. I pick up the phone on the line is my coworker at the tower line. And she says, Jordan, we just got robbed. So I'm like, wow, like boom, action. I'm about to be in a movie. This is, you know, it's my time to shine. Best supporting actress role. Okay, this is me. And also I will be getting out of work early. Cause at that time I had been waiting for five o'clock to come. And I had a few more hours to go until five. And I'm thinking, okay, we got robbed, it's time to close, and I get to go home and enjoy this beautiful summer day. So I see my branch manager rush to close the doors, and he locks us all in, including our customers. And I look at my customer, and alarm is just all over her face. She's so confused about what's happening. Now, when you work at a bank, they train you so you know, okay, this is what I need to do in case of a robbery this is what i need to do after the robbery and slide a red tape and paperwork sort of kind of and i look at my customer and i tell her exactly what we were told to tell customers I say unfortunately we just experienced a robbery but the police are already on their way there's no need to be alarmed we just have to wait till they get here so we have to stay put so they can release us and she calms down and I'm feeling so great about how I handled this situation. So I, I get up and I go to the teleline and I see my hysterical coworker and she's in tears and I, I know it's my time to shine again. So I grab her shoulders and I look at her in the eyes and I say, you're brave, 
you're courageous, you did everything you were supposed to do, and you didn't do anything wrong. And then she starts, you know, she starts to calm down and she's chilling now. And we're all chilling, kinda. And um, I'm ready for my Oscar. And during a robbery, usually you're not sharing what actually occurred. Um, you cannot share details with each other because when the police come, you don't want them to like you don't want your um your descriptions of what happened to get all confused and mixed up. Got to be fresh in the mind, fresh in the brain. So we're not telling each other what happened, but I do know that he wasn't brandishing a weapon. He, him and his cohort came into the branch and they just robbed us with a note threatening harm. So it's probably about $600 that we got. Not a lot of money at all. So we have to wait and we're all quiet during this time waiting for the police. And I'm thinking when the police get here, I'm going to see cars rolling up on the pavement, then jumping out the cars with their guns, you know, coming to rescue us. I'm like, yeah, they're going to, you know, come in and do their job. And, um, you know, I see two guys, two really heavy set guys pedaling in their tight police shorts, you know, on these police bikes right up to the front of our branch and let themselves in. And I'm looking, and it's a very underwhelming experience. <laughs> so when they come in, they uh, ask if everything is okay, and they release the two customers that we actually had in the branch. Um, then they let us know that we now have to wait for the FBI, which probably should have already been there. And I'm like, okay, more waiting, more waiting. But that doesn't mean I don't get to go home early. It's like three o'clock. So then the FBI shows up and he's in a black suit and it's ill-fitting, but he looks like he's the FBI. He even has on sunglasses and he has a French accent. So he's very official. And he splits us up individually to tell, you know, to interview us. So um, when he gets to me, of course, I tell my startling eyewitness report, the one I just told you my description. I tell him that and he writes it down in his little note. And I feel like I told, you know, the report that's gonna catch the bad guys. I did my job, I did my duty, now it's time to go. So uh, he leaves me and I'm, I put my coat on, I put my bags on, I'm getting ready to go. And as I get ready to leave, I look at my branch manager and he looks at me. And I look at him and he looks at me and I'm like, I'm ready to go. And he says, no, we have to wait for corporate. And it's about four o'clock now. So I'm not getting out two hours early, but maybe I get at least 30 minutes. Um, corporate arrives probably about in another 20 minutes. If that felt like forever. And there's more paperwork and there's more red tape and more talking and more descriptions. And we don't get out of there until 5.30. I was supposed to get off at work, um, off work at 5 p.m. So instead of getting work, getting off work early because we got robbed, I'm staying later because we got robbed and I'm feeling super inconvenient and disappointed because this is nothing like how the movies make it seem. Uh, a few days later, we find out that they did catch the bad guys and they quietly go to trial without even sending me a subpoena to, you know, to come to court. Like, you know, the movies, you get the little blue piece of paper or something in the movies. And I'm expecting that in the mail. I do not get that. I get nothing. I don't even know exactly what happened. And I feel so left out. So I'm feeling, I just felt like that whole experience was trash. So more of the story is, please don't rob banks. It's not worth the little $500 you're going to get. And um, it's a waste of your time and especially a waste of my time. So our next storyteller will be Allie Walden and she'll be sharing her story called Notes from a Pandemic. Okay, thank you.
All right. I'm going to share a video and I hope you enjoy. It feels like it's about the 5,000th day of quarantine for me, um, which I'm sure it feels the same for you. Uh, it's pretty intense, um, but you know, we're getting through it and um, I hope you are too. Um, I live in a house with five other people, um, my mom, my dad, my niece, um, and my cat, and my brother, and my brother's girlfriend. <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of people in a very small space in a small Cape Cod. Um, and we are sharing space and we are all working from home and some of us are unemployed and it's just pretty much been, I don't know, a fiasco for less, uh, for a better word, um, trying to help my parents navigate, you know, technology and how to navigate this new for us all. Uh, as an adult, we can sort of rationalize what's happening. We can watch the news and understand. But for my niece, it's pretty hard. Uh, she's four years old and she'll knock on my door and say, hey, Allie, uh, let's go to the movies. You know, she'll be in her little Elsa outfit and she wants to go watch Frozen 2. And you have to let her know that, you know, we can't go outside because of the virus. Um, and I've even noticed her, you know, making friends now that it's getting warmer with people outside and they can't play and they can't throw the ball over the fence. They're just shouting at one another, hey, what are you doing? Hey, my name is Zoe. You can't come in my house because of the virus. Well, maybe you can sometime, but you have to wear your mask. And so it's, it's heartbreaking um, to wrap your head around that when you're, when you're little. Um, but so I try to help out with her. I'm helping with my parents and I want to, you know, do more. I want to cook dinner. I want to clean out my closets. I want to donate all this shit to Goodwill, but I'm not getting anything done. I have a hard time even getting out of bed some days. I have a hard time wanting to wash my face. You know, there are certain things that I'm having to accept about myself. Um, and there are things that are like little wins. So if I get out of bed, you know, before noon, that's like getting the first base. If I eat a meal that's not Doritos and a can of bubbly, that's, you know, getting second base. If I take a shower, that's third base. And you know, if I get to class on time and I'm wearing a clean t-shirt, you know, and, and you know, it, that's a home run. You know, I, I have to give myself these little things. And if I do those little things, I'm inching towards some sort of normalcy and we're doing okay. Um, but there's this collective feeling of uneasiness that we all have. It's just this weird feeling of not like what's coming next, you know? Oh, we have to wear these masks now. Oh, we, you know, we can't go back to school. Oh, now our summer classes are, you know, have to be online. I'm taking a book arts class, which is usually like a physical, you know, manipulation, an art class that I'm, you know, excited about. How the hell am I going to do this over Zoom? So it, it just lots of things where we have to make allowances for. But this uneasy feeling, I, I was reading, and it said this feeling could perhaps be a state of grief. We are grieving the lives that we're not having right now. Even if we are not the ones who are personally experiencing sickness um, or who are ill or have family members who are ill or loved ones, uh, we're still grieving our normal lives. Like you're allowed to be upset about that shit. You're allowed to feel sad that you can't have your wedding or you can't even go to class and you can't have a drink on your birthday. You know, these are all things that you have to allow yourself to feel and if you don't get out of bed sometimes that's okay and we have to understand that you know maybe there isn't a new normal it's just a new unknown and i'm granting myself this grace and you should too so 
Um, thanks for listening. And I, that brings us to the end of our storytellers. And I think Marion probably wants to hop in here and say a few things before we wrap up for the end of the evening. So Marion. Thank you, Allie. Um, well, I just think I loved our second half and I want to give a shout out to um, Beth, who is a born memoirist on the page and out loud, as you heard tonight. Tatiana, who's completely unique perspective is always expressed through such a relatable voice. Anna, who continues to share her amazing life, so different and fresh from anything that we have known with such generosity and eloquence. Roland, he told us a story named a character, character named Jack, but we got to know the character named Roland. And um, those of us who have been working with him at UB say, Thank you for coming, Roland. Um, Kyla, this is one of the stories that was really a game changer this semester. It really meant a lot to everyone. And um, I really congratulate you for sharing it and also for finding the arc of the story through telling it over and over, which is something that we do and never know if it's really going to work, but it worked. Um, Roberta. Okay, Roberta was the other natural teacher that was in the class and was such a gift to me and to everyone for being here with her spirit and her wisdom and her years of teaching drama. And um, I'm sure we are all thinking that St. Genesius is with us tonight. And I think he is. Thank you, Roberta. Um, Jordan, your sweet, sweet, funny view of the world just comes through every time you open your mouth. And Allie, You've got so many different talents, and we just barely got to start knowing them over the semester. Um, you know, your singing voice, your ability to write titles, your storytelling, your, um, I hope I get a chance to work with you more while you're at UB. And I just want to thank all the storytellers and all the audience, and I can't believe it's over. 